thank you for that wonderful introduction. And yes, I'm equally proud of the fact that I studied in late Sri Ram College as well. So there's a large contingent here. Welcome, Rajdi. Please take your seat and thank let's begin much. this conversation. Thank you very much. So guys, we are talking about this book. And I don't know if you've read it. I have, and I haven't been able to put it down. I go back to read interesting little gupshups and tidbits in it. It's quite amazing how you have been able to sort of get under the skin of the man or the men you have written about <laughs> in this book. They're two very prominent men on the cover itself. Um, so let's begin. Uh, Rajdeep, are you comfortable in this role? You've normally been in the other role, you know, of interviewing people. <laughs> First of all, thank you very much for having me here. It's wonderful to be in Bangalore. I just wish we could take the weather of Bangalore to Delhi and its people. And its people. And its people. And its people. Uh, I said this in Hyderabad the other day, so I shouldn't say it in Bangalore. Hyderabad should have been the capital of India, and Bangalore should have been India's premier city. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, as you come down south, the weather gets warmer and the people are nicer. Uh, and I, I genuinely... Uh, I mean, when I say warmer, I mean just pleasant weather. Uh, but uh, no, I'm very happy to be on the other side. Uh, it, it makes life much easier. Uh, at least I don't have someone uh, shouting me down. Uh, and, and, and I hope you won't shout me down or interrupt me as I do with others in the television studio. Somebody just here reminded me about a time when I did that. So who knows, maybe that, Arshia, will come to the forefront. Let me, let's, let's begin the conversation because we are on tight time schedule. So uh, in this book, which is very smartly written, and I must compliment you on that, you play around with the uh, mnemonics, you know, like one chapter, you have 13 M's, two W's, and a GK. So would you like to demystify just that title? <laughs> you know, we have a prime minister who loves acronyms. Uh, you know, acronyms are, you know, short from Startup India, Stand Up India, uh, Fit India, Jam, Jandhan Aadhar Mobile. Uh, so I thought, you know, might as well join the acronym club. Uh, the 13 M's, two W's, and uh, one GK, there are lots of them. But there, if I can remember, there's something like, Modi, money, media, machine, millennials, middle class, muscular nationalism, Masood Azhar, Muslim, Muslim. Muslims, uh, uh, what else okay, is let left? Me, let's pick up from <laughs> right here. So the, and, and, and the W is WhatsApp and welfareism uh, and, and uh, the GK okay. is Garib Kisan, all of which in their own way, as I put in the introduction, contributed to the Modi phenomenon. I mean, I've spent much of the last decade, I would say now, trying to understand this phenomenon. So uh, it is something that intrigues me. And uh, I think that it's important to wrestle with it without demonizing the man or without defying him. The problem in this country is either you defy the man or you demonize him. And I think we need to find a more objective analysis to understand the Modi phenomenon. That's what I've tried. And I think in that, I'd like to link you with the previous conversation about the man Mantoyat. You need a certain bravery to be equally brutal to both sides. And you have, because while the book is about Mr. Modi, how Modi wins India, you take the Congress, Congress's trip too, as it were, especially Rahul Gandhi's. Yes, I do. I am Manto, Manto yet also begins with an M, if I remember. <laughs> uh, uh, but look, yes, I keep saying, and I said it in my first book, 2014, I repeat it now, Rahul Gandhi has never missed an opportunity to miss an opportunity. <laughs> uh, and, and frankly, frankly, uh, understanding the Modi phenomenon also requires you to understand what's happening on the other side of the di political divide. Uh, you know, as long as Rahul Gandhi is there, he in a way allows Modi to tell the story of the so-called Karma Yogi, the so-called Kamdar versus Namdar. Rahul Gandhi smacks of all the entitled, privileged, old elite that Modi wants to dismantle. The so-called Latians, Delhi, Khan Market gang, and which is a tragedy. Because I don't think most people in Khan Market or Latians, Delhi are necessarily privileged. But Rahul Gandhi is. He's a fifth generation dynast. And unfortunately, he just doesn't get it. Uh, and India has changed dramatically. I, you know, in a, in a previous book, Democracy is Lemon, I called it the Dhoniization of India. 
India's great story of the last 25 years, post-liberalization, is the story of these Indians coming from small town, tier two, tier three, from being a ticket collector in Kharagpur, Mahendra Singh Dhoni 10 years later was lifting the World Cup. That's the story that young India wants to hear. And Modi is a terrific communicator. He's embellished the story with lots of garnishing, lots of uh, hyperbole, but he's told the story. And you, it's a compelling story for a, for a new India to be told the story of this so-called boy from Vadnagar who's reached all the way to seven, so, uh, seven Lok Kalyan marks. So you need a compelling story, I think, uh, in today's India to attract large multitudes of people, quite apart from the populism and the emotional nationalism, some of it is dangerous and dark, but you also need a story, and he has a compelling story, and Rahul Gandhi doesn't. There's no story. But even as far as compelling stories go, you write in the book that till 2013, there was no reference during his Gujarat years of the Chaiwala child. Yes, you know, <laughs> it's one of those stories that he seems to have discovered along the way. Uh, uh, <laughs> But it is a, st look, whether he, whether he sold tea, the fact is he came from a very humble background. And it will always resonate. The fact is he's an OB. You see, there are three major trends that I see post-1990. And that's the, that's a critical year for Mr. Modi's evolution into politics. It's when he organizes LK Advani's Rath Yatra. And the three M's again are, I mean, I don't have these M's in the book, but they are M's, which is market, mandir, and mandal. These are the three M's which have changed Indian politics perhaps forever. Uh, Mandal brought in OBC reservation and has completely changed the power elites of this country. The OBCs are the dominant grouping. You can look across the country uh, in, in among MLAs and legislators. The Mandir was this whole notion of religious identity and wearing your so-called Hindu identity on your sleeve, even if it meant taking you know, uh, even if it meant tragically demolishing or, uh, you know, cruelly demolishing a mosque and, and othering the Muslim. And the third is the market, which sort of exploded post-1990 and opened up numerous opportunities that were unimaginable. And I think the BJP was the cleverest of political parties in recognizing all these forces. So if you look at the BJP, Modi is an OBC. Uh, Modi was associated with the, Mandil, uh, with, the, with the Mandir movement very directly. And Mr. Modi uh, comes from Gujarat. Mm -hmm. And you can't come from Gujarat and not understand the market. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I don't know that if there is any Gujarati who doesn't understand. But he understood that it was necessary to sell this dream of an aspirational India. And he keeps selling it. And there are new dreams all the time. Not all of them will be fulfilled, but he's a dream merchant. He may eventually get caught up because of pitching his dreams too high. But for now, it's, you know, he's able to convince a large number of people that I am the man. You know, I am the strong man who's going to deliver. I am the man who's going to fix India. Uh, and we've been looking, and large numbers of Indians are looking for superheroes. This is the age of the muscular strong man. Look across the world. Donald Trump, Boris Johnson... Urban, uh, Putin, Putin, Erdogan, Erdogan, and I find a lot of similarities between Modi and Erdogan in particular. You know, they are very, very, they, they believe that they alone know what is best. And maybe there is, uh, you know, that's, that's the dream merchant in him. And he's understood these changes. So if I were to take one of the most prominent M's in your book, you say machine. Yes. And you also say that BJP is the only 21st century ready uh, party. So would you like to talk it, a little more? It, it, the machine is incredible. I know this is a room where there may be many CEOs. But if Mr. Modi loses an election, please get him as your marketing, uh, uh, as your marketing head. And please get Amit Shah as CEO, Chief Operating <laughs> Officer. The level of micromanagement which which this 2019 election showed is quite incredible. You know, to, to have, the, the government claimed there were 22 crore beneficiaries of various government programs. Let's assume it's an exaggeration, as most things in India are, uh, that it's half that number. The BJP or the government of India got, gave the list of all those beneficiaries to the BJP. The BJP gave it to private organizations like the Association of Billion Minds and, uh, and Jarvis, all set up as private consultancies to the party. All your data was given to them. 
they set up 160 call centers which worked around the clock for a full year connecting each and every of those individuals. They ensured that they were, those individuals were rung up, told, don't forget, we've given you this benefit, don't forget to vote for Modi. Now you set up this operation almost seamlessly. The BJP today is setting up an office in every district of this country, ground plus two with a digital library on the ground floor. Uh, Amit Shah has given a prototype, everyone has to follow it. Uh, and they've already bought land in about 600 districts of the country. Uh, the machine uh, has covered 8.6 lakh of the 10.3 lakh booths in the country. 20 to 25 members in a booth committee. These are huge numbers. These are staggering in, in just the scale of their, their ambition. So, you know, even if, I think the machine is, the, is what sustains the BJP. Yes, the machine needs someone like Mr. Modi. It needs a face. Uh, as per our post poll survey, one in every three Indians who voted for the BJP only voted because of Modi. If there was no Modi, they would not have voted for the BJP. But the machine is intact. And the machine has been building for this moment for the last 95 years, but now has reached the stage of, you know, the last stage. The RSS was set up in 1925. We are in 2020. This is not a dream which was started in 2014. This is a dream which has been built up of building this notion of India as a Hindu Rashtra. Now we can debate that. What it, you know, it's a very contentious term. But that is the dream. And once you have the machine in place and you have a mascot like Modi, you're almost, you're almost there. It's not just the machine working very well. It's also the... I know you've used the M of marketability. It's really also the projection. The fact that you, the Congress raised the largest number of people above the poverty line, but made nothing out of it. And with Ujwala alone, a new category of uh, worker, Pracharak was created, the Labarthi contact, you know, the one who was in touch with the beneficiary. That's right. That's right. That's right. You see the... The Congress had the Mahatma Gandhi National Employment Guarantee Scheme. It's such a long you know, name in itself. But it was named after Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, rural employment. More Indians were lifted out of poverty between 2006 and 2016 than any decade previously uh, in this country. And yet the Congress was never able to sell the idea. Mr. Modi made sure that everyone who's got an Ujwala gas cylinder got a letter with a photograph of the Prime Minister. Uh, and said with a personalized letter, saying, don't, you know, this is my gift in a way to you. Uh, Ayushman Bharat is increasingly referred to as Modi Care. Wo Modi ji ki scheme hai. And the ability to create spectacles. Every year, every time the anniversary of a government is celebrated, have a song, have an event, stage it at India Gate. Uh, he is the master of, of event management. Yeah, the GST midnight uh, parliament special. Yeah, yeah, I mean, imagine that this is the only country where a tax law is celebrated as freedom as midnight. Please tell every trader in this country, I'd love to know three years later, what they have to think that the prime minister of the country chose midnight of July to celebrate with parliament all lit up, as if India was getting freedom. Uh, but that's the man. And, and that's his strength. Uh, some would say it also is his weakness because sometimes uh, the, you know, the, meth the message gets, it, the focus is so much on the, on the marketing of the message that the reality gets lost. Uh, the, the micro detailing of, of GST gets lost, uh, the troubles that people are having with it. But he's a showman. Many years ago I asked Mr. Modi when he and I were on talking terms, uh, 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 what what is, what is the subject you like the most in school? And he said straight away, dramatics. Uh, and he used to do these one-act plays. So I think he's a natural performer. You know, he's the only person who can outperform. Look at the way he handled the Houston summit. He was holding uh, the, the Trump's side. It was almost as if the Indian prime minister was leading the American president in his own country. I mean, only Mr. Modi could pull that off. And he pulled it off with Elan. You know, he does it with absolute Elan. Uh, it is his great strength. Uh, at, at one level, you've got to doff your hat. I remember many years ago, and this story is in the earlier book, but uh, we were at a big, I used to do a program on NDTV called Big Fight. And about an hour before the program, I decided not to, uh, I had invited Mr. Modi, an hour before the program, I dropped him. Meaning I, I asked Pramod Mahajan instead to come. 
Mr. Modi, of course, saw Pramod Majan on TV. I had given Mr. Modi some cock and bull excuse. So he turns, he rings me up and says, Acha, to tumne mujhe nahi liya, wo Pramod ji ko liya, kyunki unki angrezi mujhse achhi hai. So I said, yes, sir, sort of, you know. His English is better. He said, ek din dekhna, main English mein badi achhi speech dunga. And he just did that in the US Congress a couple of years ago. I mean, his ability to, you know, you should, I, I, you see, so the, he is someone who is constantly wants to be, he loves the camera. You know, he'll push even uh, as he did uh, Mark Zuckerberg out of the, I mean, he's the only person who could get away with that also. You know, Facebook, in the Facebook office, you'll push your, the Facebook CEO and make sure the camera is looking at you. Uh, I mean, that's skill. Uh, it requires some skill to do all that. So he is a skillful marketeer, but it would be unfair. I think to only see Mr. Modi through the prism of marketing. You know, marketing can only take you so far. There is a machine. There is a machine, there's a story, uh, and there is a, there's a conviction that uh, I am a man of destiny, and India's destiny is intertwined with me. Uh, it leads you to have delusions of grandeur. It means that you do very little consultation before you take major decisions like demonetization, but it also makes you a risk taker. Uh, I will not be surprised, this is my guess, that the budget of this year will contain some of the biggest surprises that India has ever seen. I think he recognizes he's a clever politician. He recognizes that incrementalism and gradualism is no longer going to work with this economy. He wants to make it Modi's budget. I thought it was interesting the other day, there was a meeting with industry and economists, and there was no finance minister there. You know, so Mr. Modi is clearly now again the finance minister also. I mean, there are dangers of all of this. There is this command and control model, and we can discuss the dangers. But he's someone you would underestimate at your great peril. So all the stories you've told us so far about Mr. Modi suggest that he is a man who works individually. You've also referred in the book to the fact that from uh, pr uh, Pracharak to Prime Minister, it's been a lonely journey. But this machine would never have worked without the second part of the Jodi. Yeah, I call them Gujarat Jodi number one. <laughs> and never in my, having been born in Ahmedabad, my grandfather was a police officer there who was sent from Maharashtra to Gujarat when bifurcation. Never in my life would I have thought two Gujaratis would run India. <laughs> I mean, they would run business India. Actually, three Gujaratis are running India. Four, Adani, Ambani, Modi, Shah. <laughs> I mean, you know, the four, the four most powerful people in India are all Gujaratis. Uh, but look, Amit Shah is critical. He's Svengali, you know, he's essentially for, he's the doppelganger, you can call him the, uh, you know, the guy, the executioner. I don't use that word, you know, uh, please like don't it. misunderstand the word executioner. <laughs> uh, but he's the guy who gets it done. Uh, and they've been doing it since 1987. The first election they fought together, people, you know, this is again not something post-2014. The first election, as I mentioned, is in 1987, Ahmedabad municipal elections. The Congress is the dominant party, and these two guys go again, micromanage, get in independence, uh, woo defectors, break the Congress, do all that they're doing today in the Gujarat model. And there are, I was told by Gujarati journalists that they would be on scooter going through the bylanes of Ahmedabad, Mo, uh, Mr. Shah on the scooter, Modi on the pillion. I would love to see that photograph somewhere. I mean, I don't know how they fitted in one scooter, uh, but they did. And let's be honest, they... They've come from there. They've clawed their way up. You know, they've clawed their way up. This is the story. You know, this is, these are people who have reached here through enormous amounts of uh, hard work at one level, but a ruthlessness that comes in with that. You can't deny them that. I mean, the story of Amit Shah, uh, which unfortunately I couldn't put in the book because I got it much later, was uh, that... The first election that Amit Shah contested was the 1983 election to his college, HL College of Commerce in Ahmedabad. Uh, against him was a girl, woman candidate. The evening before, Amit Shah's people come and tell, Sir, aap chunav haar rahe. He said, Kyon? He said, Sir, all the women in the class are voting for their girl candidate. And we are in minority. So he says, get the phone numbers. This is pre-mobile India. Get the phone numbers of the parents of all these girls. So for the next two hours, they set about getting the phone numbers. Then they ring up those parents. Some of them are even sent handwritten letters and said, don't send your daughters tomorrow to the college. There could be violence. <laughs> Out of the 80 girls, 40 or 50 don't turn up. Amit Shah wins by 25 votes. 
this is where they come from. You know, this is, can you imagine Rahul Gandhi even thinking in those, <laughs> in those terms? There is one story that I tell in the book, which is again fascinating. When Amit Shah contested the 2012 um, uh, Gujarat elections, he'd just come out of jail and he wanted to prove a point and win well. Uh, now, nobody dared to contest against Amit Shah and Sarkej. He's the boss of Sarkej. Forget this Chanakya. He's a big boss. That's his real, that's the real him. So he was there in contesting this election. And the other guy had no posters, nothing there. Amit Shah tells his people, make sure you put posters of that guy. Because if there are no posters, my voters won't come thinking that the election is a done deal. And I want lots of them to come. I want to win well. Now, how many people, now you can call it ingenious, some will call all of this evil. You know, the lines between ingenious and being evil are very thin. And I don't know whether Mr. Shah crosses them. Maybe he does at times. But he is, you know, Jo Jita Wo Sikandar. Politics is Sam Dam Dandabhe. Politics is not, uh, you know, something that uh, is, you know, is not hugs and winks, as, as Mr. Gandhi would do. <laughs> Interestingly, in your book, you refer to Arun Shori uh, describing the Prime Minister's personality as Machiavellian. Uh, there's very little difference between Machiavelli and Chanakya at one level, you know. Both of them think differently. Yeah, but you know, when you say Machiavellian, it has an evil tinge to it. When okay. you say Chanakya, somehow it seems that, you know, your, the ingenuity comes in. But Arun Shori had three. He said Modi represented the dark triad. Narcissism, Machiavellianism, and, and remorselessness. I only wish Arun Shauri had said this before he was not chosen by Modi as finance minister. It would carry far more weight. Uh, look, that's the man. I think the narcissism is inbuilt. He is a narcissist. He's, he, he, but the flip side of narcissism is this great self-belief. I don't think he has a moment of self-doubt. Or maybe if he does, he doesn't reveal it, not even to his shadow. He's a very singular man. Very, again, very un-Gujarati-like. Gujaratis, where they go, take the whole family. You know, you ever go to a hill station, you'll find Gujaratis with their khakras, their chuda, everything. <laughs> Modi does none of that. He left his family at 16. So he's been a singular personality. He has no real friends. Whereas, in contrast, uh, Amit Shah is a family man. And yeah, Amit Shah does love his wife. Uh, and, and, and says the one thing that he does miss is going out for movies, which is another great Gujarati passion. Uh, uh, and, and, and going out for snacks in the Ahmedabad Municipal Market. Yeah, he is a family man. And he, is a, he comes from a more wealthy family. Look, this is a unique... Com I think what binds them together is this complete conviction that this is the ideological direction in which this country is. They are, uh, Amit Shah is much more about winning the next election. Mr. Modi is about his place in history. Uh, but they are bound together by an element of real politic, of winning elections, but also an ideological conviction that it is time to dismantle this Congress old-style elite and build a new India, for better or worse. Uh, and, you know, once they've got a mandate, uh, they ha perhaps believe that this is their moment. I, I read today Amit Shah saying that a Ram Mandir will be built in four months and I'm going to make sure that Every citizen who's come in from Pakistan will get citizenship. I think Modi 2.0 is being, is, should not be called Modi 2.0. It should be called Mosha. This is now a Mosha government. Mosha one. Uh, he's on every committee. He's, he is the guy. And, and the same thing was in Gujarat. When Modi was chief minister in Gujarat, Amit Shah had 12 portfolios. Modi would attend the cabinet meeting and leave. Amit Shah would sit through. Amit Shah sits through parliament sittings. It was interesting that when the Citizenship Amendment Act was passed in parliament, Modi was not present. Amit Shah piloted the act in both houses. Amit Shah is willing to do the hard grind. Modi wants to be seen as the statesman, maybe get a Nobel Prize one day. I don't know for what, but he wants to get one. So you make it out as if there is no gap, like they are Ardhnarishwar in a way, you know, that there is nothing that can go through You them. said it, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but I just want to understand then, why is it that they speak different things about the NRC? One says, wo hoga, uski chronology batate hai, details batate hai. The other one says, we haven't even discussed it. See, the one way to look at it is, you know, the, the easy way would be good cop, bad cop. But I just think that Amit Shah is pushing the system too hard. 
and you can do it in Gujarat. Gujarat is a homogeneous state, is a smaller state. You can do a command and control model there. Much more difficult to do it in India. And I think the mandate that they got in 2019 has convinced them that they can get away with it. Modi is cleverer. He's realized that you can't, beyond a point, uh, create in your first year itself so many cleavages and fissures. And the NRC, when linked to the CAA, you know, raises, in, in, in some way, creates apprehensions in the minds of people. I, I say this, Modi inspires trust in his, in his voters. Amit Shah lives by fear. People are afraid of Amit Shah. You know, Amit Shah looks at you and you don't trust him. And it happened. When Amit Shah said All India NRC, he said it with a messianic zeal, which you won't see in Modi. Modi is much more, cons Modi can be a consensus builder. Amit Shah cannot. And I think therefore there will be some elements of strain in the way the government functions from time to time. And the NRC was an example. The NRC is because I think for Amit Shah, Bengal, is his Russia, is his Russian adventure or misadventure. For some reason, he's got it for Mamta Banerjee. And he wants to get rid of her in 2021 Bengal is their big challenge. And this entire NRC CA was done with one eye on Bengal. Once the NRC happened in Assam and you found that a large number of Hindus were also being excluded, as a face saver, you brought the CA at the time that you did. Because Mamta Banerjee was going across Bengal and warning every Bengali migrant that they'll bring in NRC and disenfranchise you. And as a result, he has triggered a volcano in other parts of the country. I mean, the, the, the darker side is that they are both polarizing figures. Let's be very honest. You know, we must also look at that. While they are these extremely astute politicians, they've also lived by the politics of polarization right from the start. I give a story of the Sarkhage model. You know, two months after the 20, 40, uh, 20, 2002 riots, Amit Shah was still an MLA. So a senior journalist, Rajiv Shah, goes and sees him and says, Sir, you know, there are still some instances of violence happening in our area. You must do something. So he says, why are you so bothered? He says, Sir, I have a house in Sarkhej. So he says, which side of Sarkhej? So he says, Sir, which side? Now in Ahmedabad, most parts are divided by a so-called border between the Hindu and the Muslim side. So he said, Sir, I live on the Hindu side. So Amit Shah looks at him and says, then why are you worried? Whatever happens will happen on the Muslim side. Now he says this openly to a senior journalist on record. Now, therefore, the politics of division is built into their, into their DNA as well. And they've, they've created a Hindu vote bank. Let's be honest. And that's one of the points I make in the book. The fact is in 2019, we saw across the board from Dalits to Adivasis to OBCs to Brahmins, all Hindu groups, giving the BJP a much a disproport, disproportionate share of votes even compared to 2014. So there is a Hinduization taking place, a creeping Hinduization. You see it in rituals, symbols. Everyone has an angry Hanuman I see now on their cars. Never smiling, he's always angry. And, 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 and you see it in other forms as well. And you see it through legislation that's coming through. I mean, I think that is what leads to apprehensions and fears. And they will require a lot of effort to, to quell them. You, do, you know, you pass the act and now you're going to dialogue with people. It doesn't work. So uh, that makes me think sometimes that, and there have been people who have referred to uh, the patterns as Tuglakian. Oh, sorry. It seems that uh, you haven't heard what I've said. Anyway, the more important thing was coming from there. <laughs> so um, the patterns that are described as Tuglakian, that they do things before thinking it through. <coughs> that, uh, yeah, and CAA is one of them. Demonetization was another one. GST is another one. Uh, so I want you to tell us. You know, look, <coughs> you know, to suggest that they do things without thinking them through would be unfair to two people who've been so successful in public life. Uh, but they are, they are risk takers. Demonetization stems out of your conviction and out of your incessant desire to take risks to convince, to A, destroy your opposition, because you believe most of your opponents are, are dealing in cash, and B, also to convince the poor of the country that you are a gariboka neta. 
Robin Hood syndrome. Yes, yes. Mr. Modi did, in my view, as I mentioned in the book, he wanted to get rid of this suit boot ka neta, Ambani Adani neta, into the garibo ka neta. Demonetization was about this holy war against the rich. Mujhe pachas din de do. Or man, in ko, in, uh, agar kuch nahi karu to mujhe fir fasi de do. In a straight Salim Javed dialogue. You know, he did it in Goa. But the, he was able to connect. And people were convinced. It's the old Indian, as one Maharashtra MLA told me, it's a typical Indian way of looking at it. If my, uh, if my bullock cart is stuck, as long as the guy on the other side is Mercedes has a puncture, I feel good. <laughs> and many Indians felt that. A scent of, you know, schadenfreude. That this is, you know, we, we almost felt that, you know, that these guys are going to now be taught a lesson. So I think Modi, uh, you know, when you say Tughlaqian, I think I've more than Tughlaqian, the lack of con con consultation, the unwillingness to accept that a Raghuram Rajan may be someone worth consulting, uh, the idea that a chief economic advisor like Arvind Subramaniam may be worth consulting, uh, even on Citizenship Amendment Act, maybe you could have got better legal draftsmen. I mean, I think the act in itself is, you know, was something which was agreed upon in 2003-04, that you will give uh, fast-track citizenship to, per, to those who have been persecuted in neighboring areas. What was the necessity to include all communities and exclude Muslims? The moment you did that, it seemed like a dog whistle. You see, this dog whistle politics, that when the Prime Minister goes to Jharkhand and says, I know the protesters, you can tell them by their clothes. Or Shamshan Ghat versus Kabristan. See, this is where it becomes problematic. But Tughlaqian, I don't, you know... He's, he's a dream merchant. Uh, you know, Tughlaq took the capital from Delhi to Dalatabad. You know, I hope that Modi doesn't take it from Delhi to Ahmedabad. He won't. Uh, he likes But Delhi. there is a huge Gujaratification of the administration that's been going on. There is a good... But let's be honest. Every Indian prime minister has done it. When Indira Gandhi was there, there was a Kashmiri panditification of, 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 in, uh, of the bureaucracy. And, and Mr. Modi's playbook is most like Indira. Out of all the leaders, Mr. Modi often attacks Nehru, never attacks Indira. I think he secretly likes the idea of this. You know, and Indira was, you know, if you, the more you read about her, she also dealt ruthlessly with JNU students. You know, in, in the late 70s, early. He, she actually makes Modi look almost like a cuddly koala. Uh, uh, at times when you see her. I mean, she, she brought in the emergency. She jailed journalists. Modi only gets his troll army after us. I mean, Indira Gandhi put people into jail. Uh, but that's the playbook. The playbook is, and Indira's playbook eventually destroyed the Congress. Because it became this high command culture, imposing chief ministers. You remember in this great state, the likes of Gundu Rao and, and others were imposing. I don't know, you're a friend of Gundu Rao, ma'am? I hope not. <laughs> His son is a good guy. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, that was Indira's politics. Now, a lot of that is happening with the new BJP. The new BJP does very little consultation, imposes chief ministers, which is why you're seeing a backlash in some states as well. And the only thing that will save the BJP from going the Congress way is the RSS. All said and done, the RSS holds the BJP's wider Sangh Parivar together. Uh, but otherwise, there's a lot of Indira and Modi. And, and, and that, you know, is, is, is ominous at one level. In your book, you refer to one of the M's being millennial. Yes. And yet we have a prime minister who's deaf to the millennials. You know, he, let's not say, you see, again, when we live in our echo chambers, we think he's deaf to the millennials. He has his own millennials. He's interacting through WhatsApp, through Twitter. He's got nine crore people on that Namo app. You know, people like us may not be interacting with Modi, but there are lots of people out there who he's sort of finding ways of getting you know, of, of, of interacting with. But yes, I don't think he listens enough. There's, there are the voices of, you know, why treat a young Stephanian? For example, I know, uh, you know, Stephen's students have now gone boycotted classes. Why treat them as necessarily so, some English-speaking elite? You know, they could be students from anywhere. Why not talk to the JNU students instead of labeling them urban naxals? You know, we have got unfortunately, and it's not just... And it's come right down the line into society. It's crept into families. We divide ourselves. You don't like my view, you're anti-national. You don't agree with me, you could be an urban naxal. Why? This labeling is poisonous. It divides us. So I think Mr. Modi's problem with millennials, he's got to understand, 
millennials increasingly get impatient. They're anxious of their future. I don't think a lot of the millennials who are coming on the street even have read the CAA. They are coming because they are anxious of their future. They don't know where the jobs are going to come from. They, they don't want authoritarianism. They don't want to be told where to eat, how to dress, how to live their lives. So I think there are other, other agendas mixed here. And I think it is important to talk to people, not talk at people. And there's too much in our politics which is divisive, which is us versus them, which is talking at people. Indians want dialogue. We want more samvad. We don't want beyond a point this constant vivad. And you know, if you don't, if the vice chancellor of JNU cannot even talk to the students' union with a modicum of respect, I'm not, you know, students' union may also have their flaws, but you have to talk to people, you have to engage them. But the politics of today doesn't engage. The prime minister doesn't even talk consistently with industry. He talks with his favorites within industry. That's not the way. I mean, old man Manmohan Singh has been cursed, but he used to have at least some kind of a organized dialogue with industry. So I think the young are hankering for super men, which Modi fulfills. He's a superhero for them. I still think that they are very attracted to his persona, but they want to him to have a dialogue. They want him to listen. <clears throat> this listening factor is also true for the allies, you know. They felt very neglected and slowly we've been dropping the allies. You know, I would have never imagined when I finished writing this book in October that the Shiv Sena would actually do what they did. And then for Uddhav Thakre to turn around and say, actually mixing religion and politics was the biggest mistake we made. I mean, that is a Mia Kalpa to beat a Mia Kalpa, a party which has lived by violence and communal politics for 40 years, suddenly discovers that mixing religion and politics was a bad idea. But I think the reason they did it is, again, because we are a much more federal polity than ever before. You cannot run India from Delhi. India has to be run by, by taking people along with you. Sapka Saad. But you can't tell Uddhav Thakre, this is what you'll do and no... For the Shiv Sena was only given one ministership in Modi 1.0. They had 24 MLA, uh, 20, 20 MPs. Nitish Kumar has not been given a single minister. Now, yes, it's a BJP government. Yes, you have a majority. But in India, you have to still embrace people and take them along. I mean, that was the great skill that Vajpayee had. You know, I think that kind of leader is... India is a coalition today. I don't think Telangana, particularly the southern states, are going to accept the domination of, of Delhi anymore. And looking ahead 10 years, if it continues in this manner, there will be more and more, not separatists, but more and more regional identities expressed even more strongly. I thought it was very interesting yesterday that Tarun Gogoi, the Assam chief minister, said, we must now fight this election as a regional party. So he wants to create a regional party of Assam against the CAA. And you will find more, Mamta Banerjee is combating Modi by playing Hindu, Bengali nationalism, Bengali sub-nationalism. So I think you're going to see much more of that. So I think the weakness in a way of the Modi model is that because it is so centralized, it is unable to, to in a way, take people in an inclusive manner, which is critical in a country like India. Uh, but the machine that has helped all along also continues in the office of the PMO. I mean, at, at the PMO. He has all these technologies by which he monitors states and chief secretaries and files, Tisriyank, Pragati. But, you know, some of it is not bad. You know, Mo, Mr. Modi's great skill has been to use technology. He's used technology in a manner that to ensure some element of accountability. So every file now, he can trace through an app that he has on his computer. He's very tech friendly. Uh, so he, can, he has an app which he can uh, track down on his computer which file is where. Now you, can, uh, you know, Modi has an instinctive dislike for politicians. He likes bureaucrats because bureaucrats say yes, sir, always. You know, he's much more comfortable with the bureaucrats. But one of the interesting things he did when he came to power, one of the first things he did, he found that a number of bureaucrats had got out of turn memberships of the golf club. <laughs> and one of the first things he did is cancel it. Now, that angered a few bureaucrats, but it sent a message. Uh, now, again, it's not true that bureaucrats didn't work before 2014. You know, it's, it, this theory has to be that India's independence was on May 27, 2014, has to go. India got independence on August 15, 1947. 
And Nehru did his, you know, Nehru had made mistakes. He did some good things. So did Shastri, so did Indira, so did even Rajiv. Uh, and so did they all, Narasimha Rao. But I think somewhere, Mr. Modi has realized that government has to... You see, his problem is he still believes too much in government. He, his initial promise was more governance, less, less government. government. Actually, exactly the opposite is happening. He's not instinctively... When you're such a control freak, you can never be an instinctive reformer. Because you know best. So you see all the Gujarat model. It's all public-private partnerships. It's not a privatization. So it's Adani and government of Gujarat. You know, so that is, I think, problematic in the country. You can't run India by fear. You can't encourage industry to invest in India by saying, I'll get the tax man after you. It doesn't work. So I think that's the weakness of his model. And, and therefore, while he uses technology intelligently to ensure uh, that many of his direct cash transfers reach the people who need it most, the weakness is that it also tends to alienate and make people fearful. So I want to ask you whether at all you thought that there was any role for people like Prashant Kishore, the EVM, the ad men, the interviews about by film stars about how he ate mangoes, Namo TV, the election commission. How much of a role did they have to make this happen? Look, I think Mr. Modi would have, would have still won. I think the big difference more than any of this was Balakot. Once Balakot happened, which, let's be fair, was a huge risk to take. What if these Air Force planes had been shot down? He took the risk. And once he... You see, Mr. Modi is at his best when he can play muscular nationalism. Chappan inch. Chappan inch. But, you know, his speech in Gujarat, Hamne unke ghar mein ghus kar mara hai. You know, it resonated with an audience. And particularly North and Western India audiences, North India, where... I don't think Pakistan has ever been used as often in an Indian election as in 2019. You know, it was almost at times as if we were not fighting an election in India. We were fighting about, you know, how are we going to deal with Pakistan? But he was able to tap into that sense of muscular nationalism. I mean, I mentioned in the story, I meet this boy, a straggler in UP, as many of them are, by a dhaba. And he says, sir, naukri nahi hai, ye nahi hai, wo nahi hai. So I said, vote kisko doge? He says, sir, Modi ji ko. I said, why? Sir, unho ne Pakistan ko sabak sikha hai. So I said, kaise sabak? So he turns, shows me a WhatsApp with a video of Modi looking like Bahubali, you know, <laughs> and says, Dekhiye, sir, 300 ko mara hai. Mainne ka, ye 300 figure kaha se mila? Nahi, sir, ye WhatsApp par hai. So there's a WhatsApp university. Uh, and WhatsApp, I think, is becoming a huge weapon. I mean, in real time, the BJP in Bengal alone has 50,000 WhatsApp groups. Uh, so in real time, you're connecting with lakhs and lakhs of voters. And you're able to send out these constant messaging. You and I may be talking about anti-CA, there's a complete parallel ecosystem going out showing exactly why the CA is the best thing that's ever happened. And it may not come on television sets, but it's out there. So I think Mr. Modi, all these other factors, you know, I'm having an interview with Akshay Kumar, dressed in his pink pants and all is, you know, very nice. Uh, but he was clever again there. He got the interview done after the elections were over in the south and just before Mumbai is to poll. And your, the election battleground is shifting to the north. That's when you get a Bollywood star. And... You know, he's incredible. He, he's a prime time TV producer as well. Because, you know, he would do his interviews on Fridays. Because he knows that if TV channels carry my interview on Friday, they'll repeat it Saturday, Sunday. So I won't do it on a Monday. Because by Monday, Saturday, Sunday, you know, this is what media relations people should learn. You know, cop com. You know, how to use every little weapon that's available to. But as, as one of his people tells me, what stopped Rahul Gandhi? Who told Rahul Gandhi not to be interviewed by Amir or Shah Rukh? We didn't say that. We said, you also interview me. Rahul Gandhi, on the other hand, you know, is camera shy. I mean, he didn't get onto Twitter and Facebook till 2016. Modi got onto Facebook and Twitter in 2009. You know, he's, he's been ahead of the curve. So I think, you know, it's almost a grudging respect at one level for his ability to know what it requires to win an election. There's also the fear factor. Because there is the darker, divisive side. Now the problem is, there will be people in this audience who will only look at one side or the other. And I think we need to start looking at both. And then trying to understand what is this phenomenon which has taken the BJP from an 18 to 20% party into this dominant party of India. And unless we recognize that, 
I don't think we can understand what's happening around us, how this country is fundamentally changing at different levels. Uh, you know, sitting in, in the Leela here, we may think that, you know, there is this, you know, there are multiple Indias. And there is one India which is deeply Hinduized today, which believes that the Modi mantra is the only way to, to get India going. It may work, it may not. I don't want to predict the future. I don't know who will be on the cover in 2024. Yeah, you've already uh, somebody in the to... in the flight told me your next book should be 2024. How Modi lost India? Oh. So I said, how? Why do you say that, sir? Dekhiye, kitna protest ho raha hai. You see, the problem with the anti-Modi camp is their irrational exuberance, and the problem with the Modi supporters is their conviction that we are here forever, nothing lasts forever, and particularly in a country like India. Yeah, बहुत बड़ा देश है. So let's at this point open it up for questions. There is no need for any fear factors to operate here. Please ask whichever question you would like to. <laughs> okay, so I see many hands, including one gentleman at the back. I'll just come to you. Let's start with you. I have everybody in mind here. Uh, can we have the mic get to him, please? I think we need more mics than this. Okay. Okay. Uh, sir, uh, can you just hold on a minute? The gentleman already has the mic. Yes. We'll come to him. Uh, good you. evening, sir. So, um, given that you spoke about this machinery, and um, what role right do back. you think that the media, especially journalism, plays today? Because I think ah. that there's this subtle, um, you know, um, shift in the way we consume media. Because there's, uh, you know, people who are out there to call you a Congress paid troll, right? Uh, and you know, you, you also receive other attacks like this. So given that we live in an age of disinformation, what is the role of journalism specifically today? And how do you think journalism should ally with politics? Because we are often told to believe that journalism should be impartial. You know, you should always um, receive like objective facts, but you know, today, Facts in reality, like, you know, you can't really differentiate between fact and opinion given WhatsApp, Facebook, etc. And false facts. Look, yeah. we should have spoken about the media. I didn't want to speak about it because I hope that TV news is dead. Uh, the fact is that television, large parts of it have been surrogates to those in power. Never before have, you know, when Indira Gandhi in the, in the 1970s, L.K. Advani famously said, when journalists were asked to bend, they crawled. Today, when journalists are asked to crawl, they prostrate. Uh, that is the reality. The job of a journalist is to tell truth to power. And we don't tell truth to power often enough. You know, I've never seen so many questions being asked of the opposition and so few of the government uh, on demonetization, for example. So I think the media itself has become part of the web propaganda weapon, is a propaganda weapon for the government in power. When the government fudges figures, for example, on the economy, shouldn't we be taking them to cleaners? Instead, suddenly you'll find some item coming in about mandir or some emotional religious issue. But look, there are various ways today in which the media operates. So it's not just television. Television, according to me, is the worst villain, in a way, of this kind of propagandist machine. But uh, look at the role being played by WhatsApp, which is, you know, puts out fake news relentlessly. Look at the role which is played by Twitter, which is run by troll armies. Look at even Facebook. The top four trending sites on Facebook were all Modi supporting sites in March, April of 2019 because they were paid for. Now you and I may not know that they were paid for, but they were advertising sites. So I think, and, and, and it's not just Mr. Modi across the country. In Bengal today, if you write an article against Mamta Manaji, the government of Bengal takes away all government ads. 85% of the ads for a regional channel like in Bengal go through the government. So if, you, if Mamta Banerjee doesn't like you, doesn't give you ads, your business model collapses. Uh, Naveen Patnaik, no different. Nitish Kumar, no. These are all mini Modis. They're all across us. They're all these strong men. They don't like any criticism. Karnataka, relatively better. But I'll give you an example of live example of Karnataka a few years ago when I did a story about these mining brothers, Reddies. I didn't know that they also control the cable industry. Suddenly, I found our channel was off in large parts. And then I get a call from uh, somebody, sir, Mr. Reddy wants to speak. And normally when people are, you know, the kind who are these strong men, they are very soft voices. So he says, sir, I am Karunakar Reddy here. You have done very bad story on us, sir. 
you must remove it, otherwise channel will not come back. Now that's a reality, right? So all governments want to control the media across the country today. The Akali Dal, when they were in power for 10 years, controlled cable in Punjab. You could not do a single story against the Akali Dal. Now this is the reality of this country. Mamta Banerjee has put people into jail for Facebook posts. So I think the media itself is being strangulated by those in power, not just in Delhi, but across the country. Hello. So, yes. Yeah. Where do you see India on the global map when you compare one or two decades earlier and today? Is it worse, bad, good, or better? Look, I think, you know, it, again, it's again a, has, a glass half full or a glass half empty. I think we've missed a lot of opportunities. But at the same time, you could well argue, compared to where we were 20 years ago, the world takes us much more seriously. But should a country which was growing at 8% in November of 2016, now at 4.5%, a country where the Bangladesh minister for the third time has rejected your invitation, uh, a, a country which, where the Washington Post, the Economist, the New York Times is only critical about the way the country is being run, uh, I mean, I'm not saying that you have to see them as the necessary, the, the only uh, uh, sort of the, the sole spokespersons. But I think Mr. Modi has conveyed to a lot of his supporters, I will build a great India. But it's still work in progress. Let's be very clear. Mr. Modi's great success has been with West Asia. Uh, and, 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 you know, the ability to connect with, with people in that part of the world. But it's all transactional. I don't think he has a clear foreign policy paradigm in mind. And that's why, you know, you again, it's all episodic. Citizenship Amendment Act happens, relations with Bangladesh suddenly get ruptured. That's not the way you run foreign policy. And I think in the last six months, there are serious questions over the way we've handled foreign policy. I think Mr. Modi in his first term was far more successful than he's been in his last six months. Yes, sir. Rajdeep. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Thank you. Very informative. But a little bit of confusion in lighter vein. What's the color of your kurta? <laughs> I, I am quite close. I can see it. I can put on my glasses nobody as well. Has, nobody has a monopoly on color, sir. Very well. Very well. The grass is always greener on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> Green on the other side. Quick one, if you permit me. I heard you say Karnataka is much better. I don't know whether you're aware of what happened to the girls of Jyoti Nivas just day before yesterday. No, no, I was saying in terms of, uh, of media control over news channels. Well, maybe so, but I don't know. If we ask the girls, they'll tell us better. Now, regarding Modi and Amit Shah and their symbiotic relationship, is it like the Gujarat ke do ladke, like the UP ke do ladke? And a very, very important question, I think, which... I think history will not forgive us for. The only difference that we ever understood between Pakistan and India was that Pakistan, the army had a country, and in India, we had an army. This new phenomenon of every now and then, TV channels only showing the air chief marshal saying that Rafael was a great deal. The air chief, ex-air chief marshal, now ex, saying that if we had a Rafael, Avinandan would never have been shot down. The ex-army chief, who is now the CDS, telling students how to behave. And the present army chief saying that I can march into POK. Is it about time that Indians stand up and tell the army chiefs, we've given you lovely barracks, we've given you a lovely golf course, we're giving you rum and whiskey and what you want, please stay in the barracks. We don't want to hear what you can do. Can you come on my TV program tomorrow night, sir? Yes, I will. Yes, You're very I will. good. I, I, I couldn't have put what you said any better. In fact, I was in Hyderabad this morning and I made precisely this problem point. I make this point in my book. One of the biggest fears I have is democracy is in recession. Parliament has been reduced to a notice board. You don't come at 11 a.m. in the morning and say, I'm scrapping Article 370. You've got to have a consultation. You've got to at least share the document that you're, the, the, the new legislation with your fellow MPs. You do not reduce the army 
to a handmaiden of the political establishment. You do not reduce the media to a surrogate. You do not reduce the judges into such a... Con Look at what the Chief Justice of India said two days ago. He said, we can't hear the constitutionality of CAA because there's violence going on in the country. Yes, Why? somebody... Somebody the told him who's doing the violence. There was a previous, no, no, that's another. There was a previous chief justice who, uh, who heard his own sexual harassment case. I mean, imagine if that happened in a corporate where you were your own judge and jury on your own case. So look, I think democracies, these are funded. Look at the executive. Your finance minister ahead of the budget is not in the consultations. I think the army suffers from that same problem that they are being asked to be an extension of a state which now increasingly uses national security for political purposes. Sorry, I have not finished. One but you said it better than I did. So you no, should no, come no, on I'm, my program. No, no. Uh, the other thing was exactly what I was coming to, last two points. One is, Tumi pan Mumbai chai, Ami pan Mumbai chai. Tumi pan campion aite hai, ami pan campion aite hai. No wonder you speak so well. Yeah. <laughs> My only question is this. Shashi Tharoor is also campion. Yeah, but his English I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> Neither do I. Neither do I. He, he was one batch senior, a few batches senior. Yeah, okay, only last. Several he, he, batches He wants senior. to snatch the mic. When you spoke, I thought you were Amit Shah, you didn't allow me to accompany. But the only question is this. That ghar me ghuske maringe. When we were in school and college, this is what we thought Dawood Ibrahim and Ami did. Is this the language that we have gone up with? Ghar me guske maringe, biryani khake aate hain, aur ghar me guske maringe. And finally, if this is the way the judiciary is going, I think the judiciary, the Ami and Narendra Modi, we've had it. Let's think, let's forget about our ideology. Let's forget about ourselves. We are now on the wrong side of our lives. Let's think about our kids. Let's, so all I, all let's I make, will say... Let's make India a better place than we inherited it. Thank you very much. So all I will say is basically, there is nothing better in India than an angry old man. <laughs> perfect, perfect. But you are an angry young man. <laughs> Thank you very uh, uh, much, sir. Stay uh, angry. Thing. Mr. Rajdeep, it's, it's a pleasure to have you at Bangalore. Um, Thank you very much. I'm, I'm kind of uh, not a politician. I, don't, I just watch your programs for the way you orate. A few questions uh, I'm just looking at. You spoke very well about Akali Dal and Punjab. Uh, actually, the fact is half of Punjab is in Canada. <laughs> so that's the fact. And, uh, and the rest are in Birmingham. The rest are in Birmingham, <laughs> right. And some are going to Australia now because Akali has got some land there. <laughs> So the question here, I've, I've got my question in a, a few splits. Firstly, uh, going back to your book, not into the political scenario, uh, why didn't you mention about the certain things, where, you know, something that you said that, you know, if your Mercedes is, is punctured, I'm happy with the bullet card that, you know, you are in the yes. same kind of situation. Uh, why didn't you mention that we as India and the taxpayers are paying so much of taxes, which is going into subsidies? Now, if I want to claim my tax back, I need to give my PAN number, but when people get subsidies, why don't they get a PAN number also? Something, you know, politically, you could have probably put it in the book where Modi government thinks that, okay, instead of getting a CA or NRC onto place, let's get your tax books right. Let's see who's getting, who's paying for it and who's getting the benefit out of it. Firstly, second question that I really was thinking is, Ambani's, Adani's, Modi and Shah, four, right? So, going back with the business model, I'm really good, I mean, I'm happy with Ambani's and Adani's managing half of India with all their might and right. But they have all the information that we have. They have all the NRC the information they need. They have all the CA information. If you don't log into Geo with your location on, Geo doesn't work. So he knows where you're sitting. Ambani knows where you are sitting with your Geo phone what you're looking at at a certain time and what is going to be your intention later on, like how Google does in its Google predictions. Sir, I'm sorry to interrupt. May we ask you to keep it to a question? I know a lot of us have information, but here tonight, we're here to listen so to the information this speaker Going has. back to your book, you could have mentioned that half of the information about India, all the geo users, is actually available with government. No, no, one minute, one minute. I actually mentioned, if you read the book, in Chhattisgarh, before the elections, if 
the government of Chhattisgarh gave free geo phones to people across the board, particularly those below the poverty line. And it came with the built-in Namo app. So, you know, the, the connections yeah, the connect exist between those, you know, we are a country where oligarchs are slowly emerging. You know, four or five big leaders with large amounts of money and uh, enormous amounts of clout. But you've got to read the book first. Sure. And one last question, don't mistake <laughs> me. Modi is the man of millennia. Uh, you could have compared him with Ziping or Putin because now our fight is not going to bo go with, you know, internal fights with Hindu, Muslim, Sikh, Isai. But we are going to go business-wise with global fights and we're going to fight China at the moment. So somewhere that comparison, how Modi can bring us to the level of China, so, you know, we probably exceed it. Someone just sent me a report today. We live in this world of India, China. The reality of India, sir, is very different. A woman a few weeks ago in Salem for her food, cut her hair, sold her hair for 150 rupees. So we have Look at infant have mortality that. figures that are coming in through some of India's most populous states even now. You know, we are a country of multiple Indias. We can, there are lots of Indias, sir, that are struggling still in areas of darkness. You know, let's not talk about this. You know, we can take on China all very well. Let's first get Salem right. And this is South India, Tamil Nadu. Go to Muzaffarpur in Bihar or go to uh, uh, Patrona in Uttar Pradesh and see the other side. There are far too many Indians. You know, these, we love these well-spun dreams. The fact is in design and execution, many of our social policy programs are just still not working on the ground. We've made progress, but not enough. That's why I said it's missed opportunities. We can do much more. Well, we've run out of time right now, so I'm afraid despite... I'm so sorry uh, that uh, I've not been able to take as many questions as you all wanted to ask. Do we have any time left? No? Rajneet, do I'm you want to take... I'm very happy. Okay, does everybody... Do we give five minutes? Unfor may I just request, please keep your questions to one-line questions, questions, not conversations. It reduces the ability of others to ask. Let's take five, seven minutes more if everybody is... Okay, let's begin with the lady there. Yes. Okay, sorry, 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 sorry. Okay, uh, Rajiv, so the question is basically for you to um, uh, take a position uh, if uh, BJP is a dominant political force at this point of time, uh, there is opposition even though they are sort of split. If you were to take a position, what would you be uh, taking position? Uh, would you be going for the establishment as is today or the opposition or would you look for an alternative? May I answer this question? Please? Yes, please do. You know, in the book, Rajdeep refers to something that all of us have been thinking about, which is the absent critical gaze of the media in which he fits. And when we say critical, it's not a criticizing gaze, it is a gaze that evaluates. So I think in this book, Rajdeep's position becomes somewhat clear, which I can tell you is brutal to both sides. I'm basically, sir, anti establishment. Oh, Amitabh Bachchan ka generation tha na, Zanjeer jaise picture. You've got to question whoever is in power. Should I not question the Delhi police, which goes into a library in Jamia without taking the VC's permission, but will not go for five hours into JNU, even though reports are coming in of this stone throwing, because the VC has not given us permission. Should I not ask questions? We have to ask questions. The gentleman asked questions of the army, legitimate questions. Someone should ask of our Supreme Court judges, how can the Chief Justice of India Hear his own sexual harassment case. What kind of preposterity is that? And we should be asking more questions. Indians by their nature should be more questioning. We are questioning people. That's why we'll never be China. So there's someone here who wants to ask a question. Please stand up. Hey, Rajdeep. Very good evening. Uh, Rohit here. The lady here na next. Yeah. Yes. So wanted to ask a question. What is your prediction regarding Delhi election is nearby in, in around? and followed by Bihar election and West Bengal. So three of the major states' elections are there, one union territory. I refuse to do any predictions. You will take this clip, put it on Twitter when, you, when I get it wrong, and say that I got the forecast completely wrong. <laughs> I will say this, though, that what you have seen in the BJP, the BJP got 58% of the vote in Haryana, Lok Sabha came down to 35% in state elections. Got 51% in Jharkhand, Lok Sabha came down to 34%. When Modi is not a factor, the BJP is vulnerable. Kejriwal versus who? 
Kejriwal at the moment seems to have the edge clearly in Delhi. He has got his machine in place and he knows how to, how to in a way also play the media game and play the propaganda. He's a clever politician and he's learned some lessons, valuable lessons. So Delhi, I would predict. Bihar, I would presume that the BJP, uh, uh, JDU would win if they're together. Bengal, I don't know. Mamta Di versus Amit Shah Modi is an election to beat all elections. Okay. It's the mother of all elections. Thank, Ma you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Rajdeep. Yes, um, Hi. I think the gentleman at the back articulated it very well. Um, all I hear on TV today is Pakistan, CAA, JNU, uh, and today the whole, every channel, all they talked about was Modi's speech today in Calcutta, right? Why is there not a single debate or a discussion on the state of this economy today? It's in pathetic tatters today, right? We're going down every single day. There's not a single debate, including your channel. Good question. First of all, I would advise you to watch less TV. It's I good. don't. I, it's uh, good for, I, I advise people to watch TV news in two situations. One is if you have low blood pressure and you need to increase it, watch TV news. The second is that if you're in coma and you need to recover, watch TV news. But you raise an important point. And you'll see it for 10 days before the budget. There'll be a lot of focus on the economy. And again, it'll be forgotten. Because we live, the TV business model in this country is driven by TRPs. And TRPs are in sensation. We've moved from sense to sensation. We've, TRP is a television rating point. So, so economy is seen to be a dry subject. But I couldn't agree with you more, ma'am. Forget about the economy. What about agriculture? You know, why is there no serious attempt to try and understand the nature of the agrarian crisis in India? Now, I think the time has come for us to do that. We need to change the template. I'm not going to sit here and say blame TRPs. I'm going to blame ourselves. You know, we have failed. Sure. I promise you I will. I promise you I will. No, no, you're not insane, but I promise you I will. We will try. But I, I think that there is, a, there is a structural problem in the way TV channels work now. You know, it is a low-cost model. It is not based on investments in news gathering. And therefore, if you pay peanuts as cable, you know, you pay your cable operator, we, you get 600 channels, you pay 800 bucks. You pay peanuts, you'll get monkeys. You know, Al Jazeera, Al Jazeera invest. The Emir of Qatar invested in Al Jazeera. BBC has a license fee. You give me that. Give me, why don't all the top 500 industrialists of Bangalore come together and give me one crore each? One crore, right? 500 crore coppers. And we'll build the best channel you'll ever see. CSR. Okay, I think that is a wonderful ex example of how we need to react. This lady wanted to have her hand up, ma'am. Yes. last question. Yes. Okay. Go ahead. I'm glad we were able to include you. I was feeling rotten about not yes, taking go ahead, your questions. Good evening. What I wanted to ask is you didn't mention the third of the triad, which is Adityanath. These three Yogi people <laughs> are to going towards a Hindutva state from what I gather. What do you think is going to happen? Adityanath makes Modi look good. <laughs> no, but look, ma'am. At, at the end of the day, this is, they've been voted in. You know, you and I can't sit in judgment, and that's what I've tried to do in the book, avoid the judgment part of it. I've tried to focus on the narrative. And I give the story of Adityanath and how he was made chief minister. They believe that with 300, the BJP believes with 300 plus seats in UP, this is their moment. To, in a way, make India's most populous state a laboratory for their wider politics. Now, we can, we... No, but, you know, he's an extremely popular leader among his own community. He's, you cannot deny him that. You and I may look at him as a saffron robe monk. I have deep problems with the way he practices his politics and where he's come from. But, you know, in Indian politics, to be judgmental at times is, is, is fraught with risk. Uh, and therefore, I tend to be increasingly, at least not on TV. I'm happy, happier to do that when I write. But I think Adityanath is an example. What, what worries me about the Adityanath model is that it is normalizing, in a way, the politics of majoritarianism. You're normalizing it. A lot of people in rooms like this say things which they would have never said 25 years ago. 
एंड पास इट ऑफ एज नॉर्मल वो मुस्लिम जो है ना बहुत बच्चे पैदा करते हैं लेट मी बी वेरी ऑनेस्ट आई हर्ड दिस इन रूम्स यू नो लाइक दिस ये क्या है इज इन इंडिया हिंदू नेशन वाई शुड दे हैव बीफ बीफ खाना है तो कहीं और खाए सो दो नो सो दे फॉर therefore this politics at the moment may be gathering traction you know Divi- salman khan had a great dialogue in bajrangi bhaijan nafrat phailana bahut aasan hai pyar baantna bahut mushkil hai and that's how it is politicians across the board thrive on divisions the congress has done it in its time the bjp does it even more ruthlessly today and that's all that is it is not as if yogi adityanath has dropped from heaven yogi adityanath has done because you've created an environment in up which has enabled the normalization of this politics who allowed the babri masjid to be demolished who allowed the gates to be opened who allowed the shilanyas to take place who allowed kashmiri pandits to be driven out all of this is now used over time to create a sense among a lot of otherwise right thinking hindus that we are under siege and we need a saffron robe monk in up we need a muscular neta in delhi we need yedurappa in karnataka i know where he fits in <laughs> i'm i'm not sure where he fits in into all of this he's an interesting character because i think he believes that he's he sees himself as the republic of karnataka bjp leader and otherwise he would have been in the mark darshak by now he's crossed yes, 75 yes exactly he's he crossed 75 be. he's crossed 75 but he's decided now or never so every part of india comes up with its own stories and i can see that with some of the conversations that we've had today uh, you are quite ready to work towards the next book and become <laughs> the expert of this period thank you so much rajdeep for this wonderful conversation thank you all for being a great audience